The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. All right, welcome to another edition of the Filthy FRB Show. It's Wednesday, September 23rd. It's been a while, because mostly because of my travel schedule, but I'm FRB and I'm joined as always by Filthy Tom Lawler. What's up, Tom? Not too much. What's up? And today we have uh, somebody I was really excited to talk to. I haven't talked to him ever, really, except on Twitter. And uh, he's a longtime MMA journalist since the year 2000, which uh, predates Zufa. He's written for Sure Dog, ESPN, Sports Illustrated. He has a book coming out about Ali versus Anoki back in the 70s. His name is Josh Gross. What's up, man? Hey, guys. How are you? Good man, I, I want to ask you, how are you doing? Are are you, are you safe? How many threats have you gotten in the past week or so? No, no, man, I'm I'm perfectly comfortable where I've always been, um, and I'm pretty easy to find, so I'm not I'm not too worried about it. So t- this story, the dead spin story, I had heard rumors about what you wrote about in February of 2013. Somebody told me it at UFC 156. It was uh, Rashad versus Little Nog and Aldo versus Frankie Edgar, but they were the details of it was it, it was such a crazy story. I just had to, even me, I have the most vivid imagination. I said, "No, I mean, come on!" But you got this story, and essentially, the UFC got a test, got a that showed Vitor Belfort at over a thousand nanograms per deciliter, his testosterone, while on testosterone replacement therapy. On September fourth of two thousand and thirteen or two thousand and twelve, what year? Yeah, was it? it was two thousand twelve. The test. Yeah, look, I mean, the test. What it did was uh, for anybody who was going to look at that and sort of, you know, really kind of hone in and decipher what those things meant, should have been concerning, right? It should have raised a few red flags at the very least. One, you referenced the uh, the the total serum level on his testosterone. That, that's pretty high. I mean, for someone who's on testosterone replacement therapy, and Belfort uh, has since said that he was on it since the end of the Anderson Silva fight, which was, I think, 2011, if that's right. So he had some experience with this. Um, you know, he was using it, and his level happened to be on the high, high end of normal. Now, you know, okay, so it's still in the range, but if you talk to the people who are running the protocols for testosterone replacement therapy, like the Nevada State Athletic Commission, Timothy Trainer was the doctor there, you know, they said any fighters that they licensed a use exemption for testosterone had to remain in a certain range, middle range. You know, you didn't want them higher than 700. If they did, then the commission was going to fire off a letter. If it was really high in the 900s or thousands, um, then you're talking about a situation where, you know, as Keith Kaiser was quoted, I think John Nash had a follow-up to my story on, on Bloody Elbow. Keith Kaiser said, you know, we'd, we'd think about taking you out of the fight. So this is a pretty big deal. So at the, a minimum, the, the test results showed that. We know Belfort still fought, of course. Uh, there was also a free testosterone result, uh, which is another measurement of testosterone. It's pretty important, actually, as I understand it, in terms of, you know, uh, the amount of testosterone that goes to your recovery or the kinds of things that you would think about. Uh, people who are using the stuff, you know, what they wanted for recovery, and and that was two and a half times higher than uh, it should have been. It should have been for a, a person of Belfort's age. So you know, and that was definitely out of the range. Uh, so that that was another major red flag. And you know, the the, the question is, this thing existed, uh, and so you know, uh, I, I did. I got it. Uh, you know, I got my hands on it not too long afterwards. And um, you know, I I very rarely talk about sourcing or anything like that, but I, I will, and I've already done it, uh, just in, gar- in regards to this story. No one that was an original email recipient sent it to me. I didn't receive it from someone on the original email list. So uh, just, you know, so they're not hounded or, or troubled or anything like that. I just want to put that out there. Tom? Yeah. You got a, you got a question for me, Brian? Oh, I, I thought you were going to ask. You, were gonna ask <laughs> you, guys, you guys are right. Yeah. But you, you see, you, you talked about the, uh, the free testosterone. And from my primary care doctor, he tells me that's the stuff that you actually use. That's the important right. stuff. You know, the, the stuff that, that, that makes you, uh, gives you your masculinity and, and energy and uh, athleticism. And it, it, like you said, his was two and a half times. It was... 40, almost 48 and the scale 
of normal is 8.7 to 21.5. So he was at 48. And then when he got tested I'll put again. It, I'll put it this way. Put it this way. When he failed again in that test in Nevada, I think it was uh, June um, 20. 14 or I forget when it was exactly when they caught him the you know at the awards banquet February, uh, his free testosterone was like they don't measure past more than 50 so if you're above 50 it's just a little like more than sign you know and then the 50 so he was close to the very upper limit as far as the the free testosterone went now Tom I mean let, let's just say you're John Jones and on September 3rd, this test becomes, well, it didn't become public. It was sent out by accident. And it shows him with this sky-high testosterone level. And you fight the guy, I think it was September 19th. It was whatever UFC 152 is. How the does, 22nd. Okay, the, the 22nd. Tom, as a UFC fighter, how do, how do you feel? Well, how do you feel in retrospect if you're John Jones right now? Well, if I'm John Jones, I'm going and finding the uh, closest blonde white girl I can, <laughs> and and partying with her. But uh, if I'm if I'm somebody else, and you know you get Vitor Belfort coming in with something like that, and um, you know in that fight, if not a lot of people remember, John Jones suffered you know pretty bad elbow damage, right? He, he had like a torn ligament or something from a Vitor Belfort armbar. Um, I'd be pissed, you know. I view these people getting into the fights with, uh, you know, using PEDs and using uh, outside substances, that's like assault to me. So uh, I'd be very upset. So Josh, about the story, you know, and I know you can't give away too much because you're one of the few investigative journalists in this sport. I want to get into that later. But why did it take so long for this to come out when you you knew about it shortly after it happened? And the uh, second part of that question, why Deadspit? Yeah, uh, a couple a couple reasons for the length. Uh, one, when, when you get that original kind of document, you have to figure out what it is and what it says and, you know, what it's about. And so a lot of reporting time is inter- determining you know, not only is it real, but, like, what is it telling you? Uh, and then after that, uh, you know, I was at ESPN at the time that I received it. Uh, I took it to them. Uh, one of the reasons that I did reporting with Mike Fish on Outside the Lines is because of this document. Um, but reporting on it directly was something that uh, we chose not to do at the time. When I left, I took it with me, and um, I looked at the places that would support me as I tried to report on this piece and which would be a good outlet for it. And I, you know, I couldn't think of a better one, uh, especially since I wasn't tied to anybody um, like that's been. And uh, I got to say that the editor on the story, Tim Marchman, has um, provided me like one of the best editing experiences I've ever had. I really appreciate that, and that was exactly what I was looking for. So I think the piece benefited from it. Now, Tom, why do you think that the UFC saw this incredibly out of whack testosterone level and said? No problem, Vitor. You're still going to fight John Jones. Was it simply because Machida turned the fight down? Yeah, well, I, no. I mean, it's not simply because of that. Um, <laughs> See, the no. other issue, the other issue, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure Chael could have gotten into the country because he was the other guy that they could have used. Uh huh. He was still on probation from his family. <laughs> so. I, I think it was Machida who, who was offered it and then he turned it down and said he didn't have enough time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as the fight goes, uh, I mean, yeah, that definitely plays into part of the reason why they would keep it under wraps. Um, another reason is just, you know, it's bad publicity. Um, you don't want to have it be viewed as like a, a drug sport, you know, and, um, you know, the more this stuff gets out there, you know, the more controversy it creates. And, you know, I think... Um, a lot of the upswing in UFC business could be partly due to the the controversy that's been surrounding the sport over the past you know year or so when it comes to drug testing and failures and punishments. Uh, I think that could that could have been playing a large part into uh, the rising pay per view numbers and stuff that we've seen over this past year. Um, but you know, I don't know. It's it's tough to say because you know the UFC is fans of Vitor Belfort, so. Regardless of if he was in that position, in that title fight, you know, maybe he would have been given a pass. I don't know. To me, this opens up an incredible Pandora's box of, of the possibilities. You know, I mean, Vitor looked, you know, yoked out of his mind in Toronto against John Jones. And then he went back down to 185. 
and he looked he looked incredible. Like he, he looked better than he looked when he was 19 years old. And then he goes on this, this streak of just murdering guys. And it, it seems to me the UFC just let it happen. And they knew, they, they knew what was going on. Josh, is it, is it too strong of a statement to say they covered something up? Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't go there. Uh, a person I talked to for the story, uh, someone who saw the test result, uh, not uh, original, uh, on the original list, but, you know, some of the stuff that had been going around, that was the conclusion they came to. So I completely understand why people would see it that way. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at the circumstances, uh, it, it's not it's not a crazy thing to think. So Belford had never been issued a use exemption uh, by any regulatory body up until that point. The only ones that knew that he was using were the UFC and his doctors, and I presume uh, people who were close to him, but as far as I know, uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of the situation where in the middle of all that, we, we come to realize that there's this test that, you know, I heard you what you were saying, Tom, about, you know, you got to sort of protect the business and you don't want to be perceived as a place where there's a lot of drugs. Well, by not putting out these results as they happened, you know, the UFC, instead of saying, hey, we caught this guy. Yeah, we were going to promote a big fight, but we caught him. You know, we shouldn't, he shouldn't be fighting. Instead of doing that, they held on to it, it got out, and now it looks exactly like you said that the thing that they were trying to keep from happening. So, you know, it, it, it's poor decision making, I think, on, on their part of the time. It's also confusing. You, you asked about, you know, wh why this story took a while to get out. You know, it, it's not like here's a guy who wasn't on testosterone. We know he's on testosterone. So it's like, what do the levels tell us? Is there a real indication of, uh, a cheating pattern. Uh, one of the things in talking to Dr. Catlin about it, and he sort of like pushed back a bunch as I tried to make him or have him come to conclusions on what the document was, was he was saying, look, this is, you know, this is someone who's in the middle of a, uh, yeah, raises red flags, but this is someone who's in the middle of testosterone therapy. We know they're using. So is it always like this? Well, the fact is that he was tested three weeks before the fight. Okay. So he was conceivably out of competition. He didn't expect the fight. It was a short notice thing. So that, that makes the time of it, timing of it make it feel like, well, you know, he kept his levels there. You know, it wasn't like he was all of a sudden, uh, you know, got a fight and, and pumped up. I don't know what it is, but his levels weren't where they should have been. And that's what every expert's saying. Yeah, and I've, I've researched it too. And I've uh, everything, and I've even talked to guys who use it. And they, they said, even on it, I never got above 500. And Vitor tested a little bit over a thousand on the test that you uncovered in September of uh, at, right before UFC 152. And then February, 2014, he tested 1500. And right. that, that's, I mean, that's like the type of levels that you hear about Mr. Olympia walking around at. That, and and his, his excuse for that was that he took two doses, right? That he was traveling and then he took two doses the day before the test. Of course, the date of the test and the day of you know one day of the week he said he did that and didn't match up. So, you know, it's it's hard to take it seriously. And considering his record, I mean, it's not like this is someone who wasn't associated with any of this stuff before. It's well known. One of the reasons Belfort was so controversial in terms of testosterone replacement therapy is that he had a doping history. And the question was, well, should someone who had a doping history, you know, have the ability to get his testosterone augmented? Uh, and so, you know, that was I think one of the reasons why people were so focused on him. But this test made the rounds, and people were aware of it in the sport. I know some media people were aware of it. Um, you know, I'm I, I held on to it uh, for many reasons. Uh, I'm glad that I had the time and the space to do it. Um, and you know, I, I think the that length of time really made it so you had a full story. I wrote a lot of words, and it's pretty dense. But um, it, you know, I think it's an important piece that people are still starting to unpack. You know. Yeah, I, I don't think people understand the importance of this story I, I, it, because it, it leaves open the possibility of how many other tests were covered up, especially tests in Brazil. Now, I mean, Tom, doesn't this make you think? I mean, I know you can't make outlandish accusations against the UFC. You, you fight for them. But doesn't it beg the question, hey, what else was covered up? Yeah, absolutely. Um Brian, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an idiot. I'm not like a puppet. I mean, if you look at this story, you know, it brings up a lot of questions. And, you know, a lot of them surround, are there other people out there who, who had tests um, that we don't know about? Now, uh, I want to ask Josh real quick a question. Um, 
because I remember reading it in the article and I was just trying to find it. But uh, you mentioned uh, okay, so Chael Sonnen had uh, he was given a TUE by the UFC in what 2012? Is that correct? No, earlier than that. His issues in California were like 2010. Early 2010. So okay, so the UFC was the one that issued these exemptions to the fighters. The UFC doctors were aware that fighters were on testosterone and whatever issued an exemption means because no one really knows what the protocols that the UFC were using. Uh, you know, this is, this all goes back to the oversight that they had. Um, you know, who is, who is defining hypogonadism? Who is defining these sorts of things? And why were they being referred to doctors like Dr. Pierce, which they were? So, uh, this, this was going on for a while. If you remember Mike Fish's reporting that I did with him, uh, in February 2014, uh, we identified, I think, 11 fighters that competed for Zufa who used this treatment. And as Fish clearly spelled out, I mean, the relative to the Olympics, the NFL, Major League Baseball, these were huge numbers. This was like unheard of. Some, you know, some sports had never even done it. So this is a short window. It's a crazy period of time, and this was going on quite a bit. I remember, and maybe you were at these fighter meetings, but I mean, the fighter meetings they had in Vegas, some of the people were, were talking about it like it was they're being told how to use this stuff or how to get it. Uh, wow. So, you know, there, there's certainly a lot of uh, you know, history as far as this goes. The, you know, at those meetings, they didn't tell the fighters um, where to get it, but we were told uh, how, how, how would I put this, <laughs> like uh, where, what avenues to go through if you wanted to do it through the proper channels. You know, we were right, like, and that's and that's you know, so that's definitely them being proactive and making people aware of it. It's not like a fighter comes to them and says, "I don't, I feel a little low on energy." Okay, here's a doc. You know, they're saying, "Hey, you know, there's here's this process." So they were definitely not pushing against it. Uh, you know, they they vacillated Dana White did a lot of stuff over the few years and supporting it, not supporting it, the whole thing. So they were all over the map. But the the record shows that they were definitely involved in terms of handling these use exemptions uh, and allowing fighters to use, especially in places uh, where they were doing self-regulation. You, you mentioned how many times Belfort fought in Brazil. Uh, that was suspicious to a lot of people. Well, he's, he's about to fight again in Brazil on November 7th, as well as uh, I am. So um, this stuff is very interesting to me. And what was interesting, you know, Dana would say, oh, he's fighting in Brazil because he's a big draw there. And then, you know, you, you go on Google and you type in XYZ Gymnasium in Brazil and it has a capacity of 7,800 people. Well, now, if somebody was a big draw, wouldn't they be doing a 20,000 seat arena? Yeah, yeah, but you know what? I think I think TV means they, he, they definitely do good on Globo. So I think that has a lot to do with big draw status. Sure. What, what were you going to say, Tom? I was going to say the same thing that Josh said, uh, but less eloquently. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off. So, Josh, as, as somebody who knows Zufa, you know, as well as you do, and, you know, I was uh, I was in San Jose this weekend. I don't know if, if, if you were there, but... Um, I was I, not, no. No, I was, I was uh, talking to Greg Savage, and, you know, he was just taking me through the history of it all. And Look at you, name dropping. Well, I, 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 it's not name dropping. That's they know each other. They used to work together. I, yeah, if, if Savage is a name drop too, that's not so good either. We got to work on that. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we were saying, we were saying, um, it, it's a shame that a lot of the people that have come into this sport as fans in the past three, four, five years, they might have absolutely no idea who you are. Because right now you're yeah. not you're not working for MMA fighting or uh, or Sure Dog or, or any of the other sites. So my question is, why are there so few investigative journalists in this sport? Well, I think investigative journalism is a hard thing to do to begin with. There's not a lot of really great investigative journalism anywhere. Um, you know, you're also talking about it's a niche sport. It's a niche space. It's cage fighting. I mean, it's still as much as like people. Who, I think one of the one of the things I'm really fortunate I feel like is that I've experienced what it's like to watch this sport grow inside and outside the bubble. And from outside the bubble, you know, once in a while it draws attention, but it's still not something that you know does huge numbers in terms of audience uh, either turning in the watch or, or picking up you know the hits on an internet site or whatever it is. You know, it's not selling newspapers. It's better than it was, and it's definitely you know come a long way. Um, so, you know, how much, how much coverage, what's that? What is some Hello? nowadays? 
Is anything what is selling newspapers? So, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking about like what what's drawn people, what's their interest in the sporting sense. I mean, the NFL kills. Um, you know, I, I think you know NASCAR still it's dipped some, but it's done it does all right. I mean, Major League Baseball, you know, it, it, it's weird in a ratings way, but it still draws a lot of attention. So it's more like the traditional sports. And look, it, this is still the uh, cage fighting. So in that way, like I feel. You know, the amount of people who are willing to uh, devote resources, you know, to to do real investigation. Own journalism is not that much. I've been fortunate to have worked at places that would do that. ESPN, you know, one of the really uh, main reasons why I wanted to go there was, you know, hey, maybe I'd be lucky enough to work at Outside the Lines. So, like, I had a couple pieces with them. Um, but it's hard work. It's expensive. You know, it's not it's not easy to pull off. Uh, you have to, you know, spend a lot of time and, and resources. So I think that's the reality of it. I also think it's not that important a space. I mean, it's it's an entertainment space, so it's not like you know uh, a lot of people are going to get into it because they have to know the inner workings of everything. To me, uh, it's a sport, but it's also turned into this giant business that's very easy and fun to cover because I've known the people in it forever, and uh, you know I, I definitely have always had the desire, I guess, to ask harder questions or get to the truth. And um, I, you know, I just think that's like an instinctual thing. There are other people who definitely do it. Um, I don't think, you know, I'm hardly the only one who does that sort of stuff, but I, I you know, I, I don't know. I'm lucky enough to have the time to, to pursue it. And, uh, that's, that's what I'm choosing to do. Cause you know, Tom, I mean, you, you look at a lot of like, even the guys who are really good, you know, they do great play by play. They have great scoops and everything. They, uh, they're afraid of being critical and it's like, what exactly are they afraid of? And I, I guess it's their livelihood. Yeah, I mean, I guess you don't so. Get yeah, I'm sorry, Tom. I was going to cut you off again. Go for it. Uh, well, you don't want to get locked out. You don't want to get blackballed. Um, obviously, you want you want a job, and uh, you know, if it if it takes uh, towing the company line, then sometimes um, that's what you're going to do. You know, whereas um, it, we all can't act like um, like the show cheaters and just <laughs> go out there and do our own investigative journalism, Brian. You know, sometimes us uh, us laymen have to sit back and let let uh, what's going to happen happen. You know. Yeah, I know. I know, Josh. You mentioned some of the other some of the other sports, and I, I know in those sports, there's there's more people like you that are in there. You know, looking for these stories that uh, you know that aren't PR pieces because there seems to be a lot of uh, publicists in the media. There doesn't seem to be a lot of investigators. Yeah, and I, I, well, if that's true, it's for a lot of the reasons that I laid out. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to call people scared or whatever it is, but I, I'm, I'm sure there's a decision-making process. To me, like, the only time if you're a reporter for the question to end of your mind is, um, uh, you know, what what am I risking here? Unless you're in a war zone and that's your life, like, you really shouldn't be asking that as part of, like, the reporting process. So I think it's a it's a... You know, it's a decision you have to make. Believe me, I, I've mentioned this before. Um, you know, I've I've had promoters come and offer me jobs. The UFC did that. Pro Elite did that. Other places have done it. I have no interest in that. Um, not interested in pretending like I work for a promoter. It's just not what I want to do. So, you know, I don't I don't know how other people operate, but uh, I I think uh, the sport. If you're working in a media space and you're call yourself a journalist, um, you know, you need to serve the industry that you're covering. That's what the purpose is. And, you know, some people would react to a piece like mine saying, oh, my God, you're, you're tearing down the UFC. Or, no, I'm, to me, I'm exposing a moment that should be exposed. Sunlight is good for that. And then, you know, things usually progress and move forward from those moments. I, you know, I'm, I'm all about that. So if, if, if no one else wants to do it, Brian, I guess I'm happy to do it myself. Yeah, I mean, those are some profound words for, you know, some some of the younger guys who are coming up and aspiring to uh, to cover this sport. And you're probably not going to make a lot of money, but, uh, you know, if this is what you enjoy doing, uh, those are certainly some some words to to learn from. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you on the money thing. I've, I've done all right. I mean, I'm certainly, since I left ESPN, you know, I've, I've tried to branch out and create some projects and do things and some things that I want to do, including the book. Um you know, I, I think people can do what they want. You know, they just have to put their time and their energy into it. And I, I, I don't, I don't like the idea. Well, you can do some investigative, but you're not going to make any money at it. I've, I've done all right. That's been paid pretty decent on that piece. So, you know, I, I think if, if it's your instinct to report and you want to do it, you know, that stuff's not going to bother you anyways. You're going to get out there and do it. Can we talk about? Uh, can we talk about your book here, Josh, that you mentioned? Sure. Uh, yeah, which is about 
the uh, when did this fight take place? Nineteen seventy six. Yeah, June uh, nineteen seventy six. Yeah, nineteen seventy six fight between Muhammad Ali and Antonio Inoki. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm actually looking at the poster right now. Yeah, can you uh, can you tell us more about the book and uh, you know the inspiration, where it came from, who you've uh, contacted to get the story, how many pages it's going to be, will it be on Kindle? <laughs> uh, I, I hope it'll be on Kindle. I don't know how many pages it'll be, but it'll it'll be pretty thick. I, I think like sixty sixty five thousand words is what I'm shooting for. Um, I've interviewed a whole bunch of great people. Honestly, have I uh, don't want to give them all away, but um, I've learned so much uh, about boxing, about mixed martial arts, and about pro wrestling especially. Um, I have a, a storyline weaved out through the, the piece that focuses on some great media people. I'll give away these names. Uh, interviewed. Now, all these guys watched live, uh, and so I thought their takes would be valuable, and then obviously with their perspective and everything else. Uh, Dave Meltzer, is, like his story is weaved out through it. He watched the fight at uh, Santa Clara Fairgrounds on, on Flow Circuit. Um, Kevin Ioli watched in Pittsburgh. And Monzo's Howard Johnson's, which was like a, a place people went for events, and uh, it was a big ballroom kind of thing. Jeff Wagenheim, uh, who's with Sports Illustrated, uh, he covers MMA for them. He watched at the Liberty Theater in uh, Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey. So, you know, I, I take their stories, I weave them in. It's, isn't it's, that where you're from? What, what's that? Brian, isn't that like where you're from? Where is that? Elizabeth, New Jersey. No, no, I'm I'm from the suburbs. I I wouldn't have lasted very long in Elizabeth. That's by Newark Airport. Yeah, they said it was pretty rough. I mean, people vibe, people rioted. You know, Meltzer remembers in the eleventh round, the fans were so upset, people were throwing chairs and going crazy. This was a huge. You, I mean, seventy six, thirty, more than thirty thousand people showed up to Shea Stadium to watch the closed circuit, but also to watch Chuck Webner and Andre the Giant. I choked, I talked to Chuck. Um, and Bruno San Martino against Stan Hansen. I've, I've learned so much about the pro wrestling business uh, doing the book. I, it's, I mean, all these things are so intertwined. It's actually fun for me. So I'm using the fight, and obviously you have Muhammad Ali, who's incredible, and Antonio Noki, who's incredible, and you have McMahon family because they were the ones doing the closed circuit at Shea. Uh, Vince McMahon, who's a senior, was involved with putting this together with uh, Michael Bell. Uh, Bob Arum. So you have like real personalities behind the scenes, the contract fights afterwards, people getting screwed on money. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing story. Out of all the people to write a book about pro wrestling, you would be towards the bottom of the people that I would expect. I, I never uh, took you, because I used to always listen to you on Sure Dog Radio years and years ago uh, for a long time, and I, I never got the sense that you were a pro wrestling guy. I'm not. <laughs> so that's why it's so interesting it's it's all new it's yeah i like as, as a reporter you can write about a lot of stuff that you don't know about or that you didn't have interest in and you can find interest i mean i've learned about the history of pro wrestling i've learned about the territories i've learned about what sports entertainment is but the setup headline on my on my book is the fight that inspired mixed martial arts and launched sports entertainment so i, I really dig into those kinds of ideas you know creating organizations uh you know, Ali Inoki, for all its failures, was a huge inspiration to a lot of people, uh, you know, in a lot of different ways. And so, um, you know, that, that I think that night was sort of Vince McMahon Jr.'s first feeling that, you know, what it was like to be in the closed circuit business with the national events. They were really trying to tie the pro wrestling, which at that time was not a big deal. A lot of people actually, like, were, didn't look down on pro wrestling at that period. They were trying to tie themselves to Ali and, and sort of grow their profile. And you really saw in the, you know, six years that followed that, you know, the, what happened to that business. Um, so I think it was a pretty instrumental time. And for me, it was fun to learn about. It. Honestly, I'm not going to sit down and watch, uh, watch Raw, and I'm certainly not going to tweet about it when you guys are doing all that. I mean, I think, I, to me, it's like a, a soap opera. It's like a man soap opera. I, don't, I can't watch this stuff. I think it's hilarious. But I've, I've learned a lot about the business. I talked to people who are writers with the WWE and how they came up with some of their lines and their storylines, and it's, it's fun stuff. So... Uh, hopefully it comes across in the book. I think I think it will, and we're shooting for uh, release uh, summer 2016, which should be the 40th anniversary of the match. So I'm excited to do that. Wow, that sounds like a great book. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not just saying that because you're on with us right now, but that that sounds. Really, <laughs> I hope so. That sounds yeah. uh, sounds really interesting. But so writing it, have you kind of seen how I have the opinion that MMA is pro wrestling, but a shoot most of the time. 
it's the same element, the, the, it's the same storylines that people are building that you see in a worked environment that work in a, a shoot environment to sell. I mean, how else do you explain Shamrock versus Tito, 7 million viewers, the, the third fight on Spike? Look, man, good versus evil has always been an easy storyline, and it's one that's perfect for pro wrestling and perfect for fight sports. And, you know, uh, pro wrestling has always picked up on those themes, played up to them smartly. I think in that way, any promotion business, you know, would follow suit. And you look at the way, I mean, when you say MMA, I think you mean UFC. And so, you know, UFC was built on a pro wrestling model. Early on, Zupa brought in pro wrestling people literally from the WWE to help them organize their business, create a structure. Very similar. So, you know, a lot of that stuff plays out. Uh, there's no question uh, that pro wrestling, you know, when people think of pro wrestling now, they think of the, you know, the stuff that you see in modern day and the rock and all that. But pro wrestling really used to mean like catch wrestling and used to have like people turn out and watch these, you know, mixed grappling matches for three hours. And at the turn of the century, you know, people were watching mixed fighting all over the, the world, not because of pro wrestling, but because people always watch this stuff. You know, humans have always watched this kind of thing. You know, Dana's right. If there's a fight on the corner, people are going to turn and look. And that's always been, uh, it, it's not like they struck some sort of genius thing. Uh, but pro wrestling definitely picked up on that. Um, you know, I don't want to come off like I'm some historian of pro wrestling, but I've learned a lot about it. And you learn about people like the Goldust Trio and Toots Mont and all these folks. I mean, they really had an idea of making a show that looked like a fight, but also, you know, played on those emotions. And it, it really works. Absolutely. Tom, do you have anything to, to add to that? Because Tom actually uh, trained in pro wrestling and, and he, you know, he stays home all day and watches pro wrestling. I, I don't know how he can watch so much pro wrestling. I'm the fucking man. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> he, he's going to take over for Meltzer. You know, one of these days Meltzer is going to die. And it's I, not, I, you know, it, it's got to happen one of these days. It's not going to happen. Uh, he's, he's immortal. Person. <laughs> yeah, first of all, he's immortal. Second of all, I don't think I would be the guy that would take over. Just because I watch more pro wrestling than anybody else doesn't mean I have the same mind for it uh, that he does. Nor do I have the work ethic. Let's put it that way. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's true. The that's the truth. Truth. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. You said uh, 65,000 words for your book, which is a, a considerable, you know, it, it's not a, a little book. That's Dave, like 40 Dave more- does 40,000 words a week. It's like, how? I don't know. I don't know. He's, he's a monster that way. It's pretty amazing how prolific he is. Uh, and he just doesn't sleep, I don't think. I mean, it, he, I, I was very, very gracious that he took the time to participate. Uh, he definitely schooled me on a lot and gave me some great stories about him in uh, that time. So, you know, he was, he was always a kid. Who, he always did a newsletter, man. He literally always did a newsletter his whole life. So, you know, Dave, Dave's a fascinating guy, and I'm, I'm, I hope I can call him a friend, yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Tom? I just want to ask Josh about a couple current things that are going on now. Do you, did you have anything else? Uh, are, are you talking about on the uh, Ali Anoki front? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a million questions I could ask, but I, I mean, but that's why you got to buy the book. Yeah, yeah. Which I'm quite upset that I wasn't consulted about. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's gone. To well, I'm, I, I'm, we're still uh, we're still going through revisions and things like that. So, if you have any input, let me know. Okay. Tom. Yeah, I don't really. <laughs> All right. so he, sure, he tries sure, to get I'm it and said that. I have been to Japan, and I do have a big chin, uh, and I have thrown punches at people, but that that's about all the, uh, you know, that's about all that I can advise you on when it comes to that fight. So here's right. here's. Uh, a- it's too bad you'll never get to dress like Antonio Noki like a pelican and walk out to the UFC weigh-in again. But, uh, that's, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. Uh, actually, I may be able to. That I mean, I could throw on the robe over uh, all the Reebok stuff, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, Tom. After that stunt you pulled in Chicago, reaming out the uh, Reebok people. Did you hear about this, Josh? <sighs> no. What happened? Uh, Tom was real ornery that week, man. And he didn't even have to cut any weight. He was just in a bad mood. Because he wanted to dress up as Conor McGregor. He wanted to wear a Conor McGregor <laughs> Reebok uniform. And the Reebok people said, no, you, you have to wear a Tom. Or <laughs> was it still Thomas Lawler? Did they still did they fix it? I don't I guess I guess it's a bad sign when you don't even want to be yourself. <laughs> at the UFC way. I'm trying to do anything to avoid you. Don't, you don't want to be how people betray you. It's a different thing. You definitely wanted to be yourself. <laughs> yeah. But, um, Josh, what do you think of the development with Spike, Bellator, 
and Saka Kabara or Saki Kabara, however you say it. What do you think of this new promotion that will start New Year's Eve in Saitama? Yeah, it's uh, highly expected. I mean, this thing's been rumored for a long time. Uh, Saki Kibaro, basically, as far as I knew, had made his intention clear to jump into the MMA space back in January. And they, they had talked about doing the summer card. They had some, like, behind-the-scenes kind of ambition to do that. But I think they pinpointed New Year's at the time to go. So I wasn't surprised. You know, you can't be surprised that Coker's aligned with them. Coker's relationships in Japan are very strong. I think he'll feel like... And I have not spoken to him about this, so it's just my speculation. But I think he'll feel like he's got a, a partner that can help him put on some big events that will look good on television. Um, Coker will probably play it pretty smart and not get too close. You know, the interesting thing is Spike, you know, the due diligence. I mean, this is the same network that ran uh, a pretty, you talked about investigative look, I mean, a pretty deep look at uh, Japan's ties with Pride and the Yakuza when they had that television show. Uh, so, you know, now they're uh, doing business with this, the same guy who um, has come out clean, apparently, but uh, he's always someone to be interested by. And I'm, I'm curious. It does feel like they're trying to recapture some kind of magic, bottle that stuff again. That never works. And so, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what they'll do. Um, you know, Fedor's fighting again. They honestly just got to put him against Kimbo and just be done with it and, like, have just a massive kind of event because that's that'll get people interested. But they're talking about having soccer, soccer Rabba fight. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to see that. So you know, it Joseph, really depends on what they do. I yeah. heard Arona signed. Oh yeah, yeah, Arona. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing no, Usada is not going to come knocking on his door. I mean, that's another thing about this is that uh, Bellator feels like I think that no one's paying attention to them on the drug testing front, and so they can kind of like skirt by. Coker's never had really much of an ambitious record on this stuff, so you know. They're growing. They have a lot more fighters in the roster, and now it seems like they're expanding and then you know, do these things. We know Japan has no history of testing for steroids. Pride contracts said we don't test for steroids. So um, I, I think it's a different time. They can re try and recapture whatever match they want, but they, they better factor that stuff in. And I think that you know at least the Bellator fighters on that card uh, you know, should undergo some, some real kind of testing. And I, I hate to be harping on it, but I just think it's the reality of the world we live in. And uh, you know, just because UFC takes a bunch of hits, when uh, when Bellator, which is trying to be on the same plane as them, really doesn't do much. I mean, that doesn't seem right either. You know, uh, Tom, here's a question for you. I mean, what is the value add for Bellator here? What do you mean? What What are they adding to their product by teaming oh. up with, to, so we can see Fedor versus Kimbo? I mean, I'm a big fan of Fedor, but is Fedor really a big deal? Well, I think it just falls, you know, perfectly in line with their strategy uh, currently as far as having, you know, a few big shows a year that you can build around, make them television events, and then kind of sustain business the rest of the year at, uh, at these different, you know, house shows or whatever they are um, on Friday nights that aren't the huge Bellator events. So I think, I think it's a big benefit for them, actually. I think uh, it'll give them another big, you know, a big feel for a big time show. Uh, around New Year's Eve, and I think it'll generate some buzz for him. And, you know, I'm sure it's something that Spike wants. Um, you know, Spike kind of desperately was hoping Glory would take off, and it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's not a bad idea for them to throw some more of their eggs into this uh, mixed martial arts basket and, you know, take a chance with something a little bit outside the box um, by, you know, aligning Bellator with, uh, you know, a new startup company in Japan. But Josh, you know, it, it doesn't seem like Spike and Viacom did much research before introducing Saki Kabara. I mean, they introduced him as the founder of Pride when in reality right. he only came in in 2003 when the other guy was whacked by the Yakuza. And, uh, and like you said, their own show, MMA Uncensored, did a great piece. And I, I it was a guy's, guy's name, um, Herbertson, Dan Herbertson, is that the guy who produced Yeah, Dan it? Herbertson, who uh, worked for me back when I was at Sherdog. He was a great photographer and did some writing, an Australian guy. Okay, did he produce the video? Uh, on? I think he was involved with that, yeah, with okay. uh, Mirko Krokop's old manager. Yeah, yeah, so uh, do you think that they don't know what they got themselves into? Like, maybe only the people that have been around forever, like you, actually know the, the where the bodies are buried, so to speak? 
No, I don't think I don't think so. I think they're well aware, as you said. I mean, that was on their program. If they if they if that was news to them, you know, then they're probably going to feel pretty sheepish. Uh, and Spike TV has been in the MMA business for a long time now. Um, you know, more than enough to to know who's who. And so, uh, you know, we'll see. I think for them, it's they're committed to combat sports programming. Um, clearly, you know, they have uh, all three elements of that: uh, boxing, kickboxing, MMA. Um, it, it feels like MMA is their wheelhouse, and you know, as Tom said, the kickboxing doesn't seem to take off. We saw, you know, they want to create these big events, but the, the ratings for Dynamite weren't that great. Um, I think kickboxing had a bunch to do that. No one cares about kickboxing in the U.S. And um, and I don't I don't mean to disparage any kickboxers, but that's just kind of the reality of it. And uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure you know what numbers they'll pull on a New Year's Eve card. You know, so. I think they have to really make interesting choices as long as they're not on the contract on the hook for Fedor. I think that's a big deal. If they can have Fedor fight in Bellator associated events and not cover the cost of that, I think that's a huge benefit to, to Coker. And if Fedor's lined with Saki Kibara, that's, that's the, the basic, basic assumption here. So it's kind of interesting financial dynamics of play. Um, I'd like to see how more of that's constructed, but um, yeah, it's, I think it's it's always good. The fight space is never boring. Uh, you never want to see sort of retreads or people coming back trying to find the magic again. But uh, I think that there's interest because that's a good thing because in Japan, the sport had really suffered. And uh, my understanding is companies like Pancrase are doing really well now. So maybe there's a time for an uptick in the MMA business in Japan. That would be great. Yeah, if, we, if this possibly leads to a giant Silva comeback at any moment, uh, <laughs> it's more than worth it in my book. But I'm Jeff- with you. Josh, I think you hit the the nail right on the right on the head there. With uh, as long as they're not on the hook for a large portion of Fedor's pay, then it's fine. But if it's if the risk is on them, then it shows that the companies that get in business with Fedor and put all the risk on their back, they die. I mean, it, it's a tough business to be in. Yeah, yeah. I, re- I remember I remember when Coker signed Fedor, and uh, I wrote at the time. Um, you know, this is, they have a bullseye on them now, not just from what the UFC is going to go after them, but like, you know, they put a bullseye on themselves because they're changing their business model. That's how much Fedor impacted them as a promoter. And so, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's, Coker may have learned a lesson there by having uh, someone else partner with the guy and then still get him on TV. Yeah, and the, the talk is the uh, guy that opened up that gym in Bahrain, the son of the, the king of Bahrain, has something to do with Saki yeah. Kabar. Yeah, I've seen some of that too. That's interesting. Like Frankie Edgar, I saw a sign with him and a bunch of guys. Yeah, so it's kind of funny, Tom. I don't know if you've seen it, but Frankie Edgar is saying like that's his home gym when it's like 8,000 miles away and he's been there once. All right. Well, that's where the checks are coming from. I guess that's how you define it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think Conor McGregor's coach is like the uh, – uh, John Cavanaugh is the is the uh, whatever like the coach uh, honorary coach. I mean, yeah. So Tom, you you got anything in closing here for Josh before we let him go? No. Yeah. <laughs> very very informative. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, th- this is a guy that's been around covering the sport uh, since before. Like I said before, Zufa 2000. I mean, this sport was was nothing. It was on Indian reservations, and uh, you know, here's a, a smart guy who decided to cover it. And uh, so, look for that book uh, next next summer, the Anoki and and uh, uh, Anoki and Ali book. And Josh, how can people find you on Twitter? And I know you have a podcast that you do. So, how do people uh, get in contact with you? Sure. Um, Twitter is the only social media I have, so it's at Y-A-Y underscore Y-E-E, yay ye It's a stupid story from a friend of mine. Friends call me J-G, and one of my friends is too drunk and call me yay ye so it's kind of just stuck. Um, and then, uh, you know, as far as the podcast, I mean, I, you know, I've been focusing on the book, and i got to admit I've been lagging on the podcast, so I haven't done it too much in the last two months, two and a half months, but... Hopefully, here I'm going to have some cool stuff to announce, and we'll get back to on that uh, podcasting and getting on the air again. I really do love it, and I appreciate you giving me the chance to be on your show. Thanks a lot, Josh. I appreciate it, man. Okay. Take, Take care. care.